It's going to be Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, here we go. And God said, Let there be a firmament, an expanse of the sky, in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters below from the waters above. And God made a firmament, the expanse, and separated the waters which were under the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the firmament heavens. And there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Heard a preacher preaching this working on the second day. What is the second day of the week? Monday. Monday. I want you to look, if you look at the story there in Genesis 1, Monday, or the second day, is the only day that he doesn't say, and it was good. (laughs) So if there's any part of you that ever goes, you know, is this, like, wrong of me to feel this way? God's with you on Mondays. So... (laughs) So if any, you know, I, and I heard that, and I was like, that is so good. Um, I want to ask you, as, as we're, we're stepping into this, uh, this work of Genesis here, what, what do you believe concerning this? I'm not asking you to answer out loud, but I want you to have an understanding that there are, there's a reason why we here at this church, and we may even disagree on some different um, interpretations. The fancy word is hermeneutics. Um, concerning the scriptures. But for the most part, I believe, and, and our doctrinal statement holds to this, we believe into a literal interpretation of the Word of God. Okay, so I'm just telling you that, that that's, that's our, I'm not trying to hide something from you. I'm going to show you our cards on that one, that, that that's where we stand on that. And so as I present this information to you, I'm going to present the story. Sometimes scientific stuff will come up, sometimes it won't. Um, But I want you to know that even the people, and I'm going to quote something in a moment here, the people that would look at people that think like me, so I'll just make it me for a moment, they would think that I'm a buffoon that I believe that. But if I spend enough time talking with those individuals... I would find out, even if they held to some this scientific thing that they and it has been proven, if I had enough conversations with them, I'm not like trying to get my buffoon detector out concerning everybody I talk to that doesn't agree with me. But there, there are most of the time as I have conversations with people, they believe things that I'm like, really, you believe that? You know, in my mind, I'm saying that. Educated people that believe certain things about certain things. Like I hold to certain things concerning life, certain things concerning sexuality and marriage and and things along that line. And these these people would look at me, and I've even had discussions, and they'll just look at me, you really, that's so backward, it's so old that you believe, you know, you think like that. But then they believe certain things. That it, and they, you know, it's wrong for you to force your religion on me. But they believe in certain things that are immoral in their minds. If nobody, if not everybody recycles, they think it's immoral, and they, they, the vein would start dancing in their neck about that thing. And I, I can respect that, and I want to be a person that respects all different viewpoints. And here, why, why does a person think that way? But I would love to have the same respect given to me as opposed to, boy, you re- you're banking on this? And I am. And the reason I'm banking on this in Genesis 1 is I'm banking on this in Romans 3. And in the words of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I've got to go with it like that. So as we're working through this, I'm going to be sharing... Um, the story and maybe some ideas concerning how this might play out, but ultimately, um, it's got. I got to keep coming back to the book, and my 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 thoughts concerning origins. 
say, oh, so on this side of in the beginning, God, so uh, this, this time zone here, origins, and then my eschatological views or my prophetic views or my um, the, 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 the coming of Christ and the, the um, kingdom, millennial kingdom and the new heaven and new earth, judgments and all that stuff in there, I, I hold to, I, be, I believe, I have certain things I believe concerning those things. And I'll even, maybe even get into a heated discussion about them, but these things aren't necessarily going to be the hill I'm going to die on type thing. Does that make sense? There's, there's some flexibility in there. Some of you are like, no, no, I've got it all charted out. Jesus is going to come like next week. I'm ready. You know, Good. I'm proud of you. Um, so that, and then when it comes to origins, I've got things that I really firmly believe concerning them, but I've got to be careful that I'm not too incredibly dogmatic of how that played out. Does that make sense? And the answer is yes, it does make sense. Okay. Because I, I do have a stand that I take on this, but I've got to be really careful about how I communicate as opposed to as time goes by, and the, there's the beauty to if I read it in the story here of the Word of God, I just share the story and let the Spirit of God work on hearts. I say all that in, in, to start with because uh, back in November of 2006, in an article on Newsweek magazine, by a guy named Sam Harris. He writes this in a, in a, a uh, Politics of Jesus issue of Newsweek, November 2006. He says this in the next quote. Despite a full century of scientific insights attesting to the antiquity of life and the greater antiquity of the earth, more than half the American population believes that the entire cosmos was created 6,000 years ago. That is, this is incidentally about 1,000 years after the Sumerians invented glue. Those with the power to elect presidents and congressmen and many who themselves get elected believe that dinosaurs lived two by two upon Noah's Ark, that light from distant galaxies was created en route to the earth, and that the first member of our species were fashioned out of dirt and divine breath in a garden with a talking snake by the hand of an invisible God. Yeah, I actually believe that. <laughs> See, the way Sam Harris is writing this article, can you believe this? He, he goes on and he says, this is embarrassing. But add to this comedy of false certainties the fact that 44% of Americans are confident that Jesus will return to earth sometime in the next 50 years and you will glimpse the terrible liability of this sort of thinking. See, the danger lies in some people's minds to people that actually believe the Bible. That's the danger. And so that's why I started off the talk, what do you believe? What, what is your standard? Where do you take your cues? What, what is the thing that when it all comes down, this is the, the bedrock of what you hold to? See, I'm personally, and this is something that I've got to be careful about in the area of saying, and, and because I believe this, you need to believe this, okay, on, the, on this part. I believe in a young earth, and we'll talk about that more. But there are people, Christians, love the Lord, that believe in an older earth. But I'm just, I'm showing, instead of trying to, and I'll give you this viewpoint, this viewpoint, and you decide, I'm just telling you, this is what I believe. But I, I have to be really careful that I'm not too dogmatic. And it is such and such an amount of years old, because I think that's where we get in trouble. But I don't believe in evolution. Not even the, theistic evolution. And here's Why? Evolution, the standard behind evolution is survival of the fittest. So things have to die. And I read in the word that death did not come until sin. And so theologically, it doesn't work for me. You, say, you might be saying, well, why is this young earth thing that important? GQ magazine, which I know all of you read, um, December 2012, and 
this Marco Rubio is being interviewed in it. That's not Marco Rubio, that's Channing Tatum. Isn't he hot? <laughs> um, but Marco Rubio, who is from Florida, is many people in the Republican Party are looking to him as a person that may be potentially the President of the United States. And I read the, art, the article, and they're talking about family. He's Hispanic roots and, and, and um, just all these different things concerning him, asking questions right in the middle of the conversation. How old do you think the earth is? I don't know if you heard about this. He says, I'm not a scientist, man. I can tell you what recorded history says. I can tell you what the Bible says, but I think that's a dispute among theologians, and I think it has nothing to do with the gross domestic product or economic growth of the United States. I think the age of the universe has zero to do with how our economy is going to grow. I'm not a scientist. I don't think I'm qualified to answer a question like that. At the end of the day, I think there are multiple theories out there in how the universe was created, and I think this is a country where people should have the opportunity to teach them all. I think parents should be able to teach their children what their faith says, what science says. Whether the earth was created in seven days or seven actual eras, I'm not sh sure we'll ever be able to answer that. It's one of the great mysteries. And some of you might be going, oh, he dodged a bullet there, or he was just trying to be careful or politically correct. I think it was a valid way of answering the question. But the, the thing is, I think tied to that question is this. If you are a person that could potentially be president, I'm, we're going to ask you a question that hopefully will make you look stupid. And, that, and isn't this what goes on? Okay. And so I come back again to you, and I, I really like how he answered it that we got to be careful with our dogmatism concerning certain things concerning the origins and certain things concerning esch eschatological views. But I'll tell you, there's such a beauty, there's such a beauty to telling the story. I like something that was said here by John MacArthur. He says this, Science is not a hermeneutic for interpreting Genesis or for that matter, matter, for interpreting any other portion of Scripture, science is not a hermeneutic. It is not a principle of interpretation. The Bible, and I don't know if this bothers you, but I believe this, the Bible does not bow to science. The accuracy of the Genesis text is no different than the accuracy of any other portion of Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture comes not by any private interpretation, but holy men spoke of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I, and so I'm going to keep going with the Word of God. And I think what will happen regularly is science will back this up. Science will come alongside and say, boy, you were right. Um, but I think on some of these things, we have to be extremely careful. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into this text and allow the Word of God. And maybe some, there's also a beauty to, as we talk about the story, boy, could it have been this way? I'm not sure. But to throw it out for thinking, there's ministries like Answers in Genesis. There's a creation museum. There's Creation Institute of Creation Research. There's a bunch of different uh, information out there, let alone if you're of a different mindset. Obviously, there's things in, in universities being taught, and we all have access to things. And we've got the Internet that never lies. So, so we have the freedom to, to have these things read, and you come to a final decision, but I want to say that I'm going to keep coming back to the Word of God. And, and what does this look like? I'm not, to be honest with you, I can't be too dogmatic about um, some of this, but I can say, Father, help me to have somewhat of an understanding. So let's pray and then jump into this together. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for telling the story and giving us exactly what we need. You, you uh, to have a life of, of godliness here. I ask you sometimes, Father, that you just give us an understanding of, of uh, your will. And, and many times, Lord, you, as you've allowed us to read the word of God, there are certain things that we, we get sidetracked on. Uh, we got the, the guy who is big on the origins or big on the prophecy and his marriage is a joke. 
and I, or the, the, the individual that goes to a bunch of conferences all the time, they're getting information, information, information. But he, he doesn't even talk to his kids. She, she's caught up in, in hobbies and, and things that don't matter. And, Father, I'd ask you that we would be people that, as we read the Word of God, Father, you, by your Spirit, you'd use it to change our lives. So, Father, would you, would you do that work today? And I ask you, even as, as this is going on, as we're talking about this, we, we, that we'd have a little bit better view of the, the power of you, the, the, the God that, that we've been led in worship to sing about today. You, you God of wonders. Thank you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Point number one, point number one, um, Let's just jump in here. He speaks the expanse. If you, if you have a, a bulletin there, you can pull out those notes and fill in some blanks and maybe write in some scriptures or maybe some thoughts or maybe something else that hits you as you uh, are hearing this and some things to check on. I, the things that I um, am giving before you, I've checked on uh, some of the information so that, you know, is this accurate? Is, it, is this just something that it was written down by some person? And, and uh, so I, I feel good about uh, the, the study that I've done, but I ask you to be people that are like the Bereans who, as you heard the word of God, you checked on these things and you, to see if they, they are so. I think that what a beautiful thing that we would be like that. So look at verse 6 again with me. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. This, this word expanse, the King James word is firmament. This is the portion of God's creation named heavens that which man saw when he looked up, that, it, that is in the atmospheric and stellar heaven. This word expanse is a Hebrew word, rakia. And the idea is the idea of a spread out thinness. And so, and the word is used here in Exodus 39 verse 3 to give you an idea of this spread out thinness here and what the word is um, when they were um, making things in um, the book of Exodus here. And they hammered out gold leaf and he cut it into threads to work into the blue and purple and scarlet yarns and into the fine twined linen in skill design. So as they're making the tabernacle and they're preparing, the, this is hammered out gold. And that, so that's the idea of this thinness here, that there's a separation uh, created by God. So he, God speaks the word and that you'll see that and that's why God emphasized with us how there's power in the spoken word even with us but this is the creator God and he cre he says let there be an expanse and so that's that flattened out pounded out thing that he's created and I don't know what this looks like I mean we've seen movies over the years with this this guy holding this globe and it's glowing and things like I don't know how what how it played out for God he can do what he wants. But he's got water separated from water. And there's this atmosphere that he's created. Verse two, uh, point number two. He uses the expanse. He uses the expanse. Look at verse seven. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. So God says something, and it happens. This word um, made is asa, different from the word create, bara. In the beginning, God created. They're synonyms, but it seems to be the case. Uh, creation is always ex nihilo, out of nothing. That God, who created everything also fashioned things from what he had already made. So they're synonyms, but it may be a different way of communicating it that he used or he, you know, he had the water, just this mass of water, he formed this globe, and then he spreads it out with his hands, however he does it, and now there's this water, atmosphere, and then the earth. The words under the expanse, it refers to the sub subterranean uh, reservoirs, and we hear about those in Genesis 7:11, uh, just as the flood that has hits the earth in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 
on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. So the flood, which is another event that we believe happened, I say all that because I don't know where all of you stand on these things. I don't know where you stand or maybe as you've grown up, you've gone off to college and you've learned some things and you come back here and you may go, oh, boy, it's nice that you believe all that stuff, but I'm just telling you we, this is what we believe. And there's an interest and the beauty of telling the story, and I keep saying this to you, people are interested in talking about these things. I mean, I don't know if it happened for you when the, the, the miniseries came out, The Bible. We got phone calls from relatives. Boy, this is, they, they, they haven't been in church for a while. They wanted to talk about it. Next spring, a movie is coming out called Noah. Russell Crowe is Noah. And, it's, and we had opportunity, Kim and I were at a conference uh, in uh, Dallas, a Catalyst conference. It's like an Andy Stanley conference. And they said, please put away your phones. We don't want you to, to videotape this. Uh, and put it on YouTube, and you're so cool. But they showed us the trailer to the film. It looks fantastic. Um, I don't know how firmly they're going to hold to, because the last Noah I saw was, um, I think it was, who was the guy from? Um, no, no, that yeah, that's Bruce. Bruce Allen. No, I was a, this. This was actually a, a thing that was on TV with um, the guy from Midnight Cowboy. What was his name? Yeah. Say it again. John Voight, John thank you. Good job. A little movie trivia. Um, John Voight is Noah in this one, like, I don't know, it was a Turner production, but Noah had pirates going after him and stuff. It was just, and you know, he's fighting them from the, the boat, and I'm going, really? <laughs> I didn't read about that, you know. Um, but this looks a little more legit. They'll probably throw in uh, things here and there. But the point being, we believe the Bible. And we believe in the fact that uh, there was a, a literal flood that hit the earth. And what happened in the flood, the water, there was this canopy, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it was, it was waters from the deep that burst forth that would have affected this earth, and waters that had been spread up from the expanse that poured down. I don't believe it's this above the expanse. I don't think it's talking about clouds. The words here used is word, the word for water as liquid, and it's used 500 times in the Old Testament. There are about six Hebrew words for clouds. None of them are used here. So in 1,600 years, there would be a worldwide flood. There's not enough water in our atmosphere to drown the earth. In fact, the most water in recorded history that, as I was doing study concerning this, is uh, from 31 days of rain in India, 366 inches came as a result of that. And that's about 30 feet of water. That's not enough to go above the mountains and drown the whole earth. Peter, as he was dealing with people that were not too concerned about judgment, uh, he says in his letter, his second letter, Second Peter 3, 4 through 6, said this, They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. There will be people as you talk about, because we don't just talk about the love of God, we talk about the wrath of God. The gospel is balanced. And sometimes it seems like the church steers clear of that. It's just kind of like our thing of, oh, I don't want to tell them how mad God can get. I don't want to tell them how, because we can't do that. And God's like, no, it's like it's in there. Let him take care of how they respond to it. And so that's what they were doing. This As early on, they were going, oh, things have always been this way. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the water that then existed was deluged with, the, the world that was existed were, were, was deluged with water and perished. And ultimately, he talks about the final judgment, that being a judgment of fire. It seems that before the flood, there was no rain. Genesis 2, 5, through six, 5 and 6. 
When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain in the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. So it seems that that was the case. So this above the expanse, this possibly could have been a canopy of water vapor that acted to make the earth like a hothouse, provided uniform temperature, inhibited mass air movements, caused mist to fall and filter out ultraviolet rays, and thus extending life. Point number three, he names the expanse. Look at verse eight. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. As we said last week, we believe in a solar day, a 24-hour day, and this is the atmospheric heaven. And it seems that the pre-flood earth was different. What potentially would a vapor canopy had done to the earth. So let's make sure that we're all on the same page that what this might have looked like. That's why I want to be careful. I shared with you and as you know, we're trying to understand what this might have looked like that there was this planet here called Earth or still is obviously with lots of land in it. I don't we don't know how much sea and things like that. In fact, if you talk about the new heavens and new earth, he talks about and there is no sea. And that verse always was intriguing. As you do study, so but there were rivers because we had the Tigris and Euphrates, and then there's these underground fountains, this water under the expanse. Then you've got the atmosphere. Then it seems that you've got this canopy of water. I don't know how thick it was or what that looked like, but what potentially could have been the case. Just and by the way, this is kind of that that. Let's, let's think about this and let's talk about it. We want to be careful that we're not too dogmatic, but, but it kind of makes you smile as you think about this creator God, what this could have looked like. It might have been the fact that there was a constant temperature except at night all over the world. Just envision that. It might have been that there was constant evaporation, constant irrigation, Constant warm temperature, not as intense. What would the result of something like that look like? Lush vegetation. There has been fossil life, and as I was listening to different people and reading different things concerning this, talking about palms that are found in Alaska. 90-foot fruit tree in Siberia. I don't know why 90-foot makes a difference. But if it's anything tropical, why it would be there. Quick frozen with ripe fruit and leaves. Large fossil leaves in Antarctica. Broad leaves found in Cairo. It's intriguing to think about. Why would those things be there? And I know that maybe there's some scientist in the room and you would have some sort of reason. Great. But it creates an interesting conversation. So that could be. It also seems that there would have been no harmful radiation. If that's what's around, the sun would have to go through that, still light the earth, and there would be no harmful radiation. And maybe that would explain the length of life. Because some of you, I don't know if you've ever read the Word of God, and you go, man, Noah lived to 950 years. Now, did he literally mean that he lived to 950 years? I'm going with it. Because I'm back to my first thing that I saw. I believe it. Up until Noah, some men lived into the 900s, according to the word of God. Noah died at 950. Shem, 600. So think about that. Noah lived pre-flood. Remember, he was and in the midst of the flood and a little post-flood. But in the, he, and he preached all those years as he's building this big boat, And all that time, if there's this canopy, he's not hit by some of the things. And we see here Shem, 600, Arpaxad, 438, Shelah, 433. I'm going down through the genealogy. Eber, 464. Do you see the numbers dropping? Peleg, 239. Reu, 239. Serug, 230. Nahor, 148. Terah, 205. Abraham, 175. Isaac, 180, Jacob, 147, 
Moses 120. Could it be, just thinking out loud with you, that the harmful radiation didn't affect the age? In fact, Moses writes here, Psalm 90, verses 9 through 11, says this, For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or by, even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Something happened in the flood. Aging was affected. This has bearing on science, and what I'm about to pass on to you, I do not understand all of this, but I do have an understanding as it was explained to me and written, but the idea of dating things, and what I don't mean what we just talked about in the Song of Solomon thing, okay? I'm talking about dates of the earth and, and how do people come to understand that. But there's a, a combination between statistics of carbon-14 and carbon-12. And when those things are put together, there's mathematical principles done so that ultimately they come to, oh yeah, that was such and such an amount of years. But let's just say that there was this canopy. That would have bearing on what was on the earth at that time. And so it messes because sunlight and radioactivity and all that stuff affects those things. And so when you combine them, those numbers would be skewed. Those numbers, if uniformly the earth has always been the way it has, then the numbers would be consistent. But there would be a breakdown. That might be the case that would have affected and given a different appearance of age. There may have been even more air pressure in the planet. This would give all more strength. Animals only grow to the size of their cardiovascular efficiency. When an animal's mass cannot get enough blood and oxygen, it will stop growing. And so some people have a problem with the whole idea of dinosaurs. I've met Christians before that do not believe that there were dinosaurs. But there's a lot of proof that there were dinosaurs. And so, what do you do with the dinosaur? It makes, and even Job talks about dinosaurs. So what, what do you do with it? Could it be that an animal that weighed 40 tons could not exist if it did not get enough vegetation? Pre-flood, lush vegetation, lush land to be able to move and, and um, roam and eat and eat and eat. Many believe that the dinosaurs would have been on the ark and some are like, how big was that boat? 450 yards long. You wonder why it took him so long to build this thing? 75 yards wide. Almost a football field. Three stories high or about 45 feet high. Animals need more land. Uh, there probably wasn't enough vegetation afterwards, and so many believe that dinosaurs were the first animal affected by the fall and the sins of man. Genesis 6 talks about giants in the land. Lots uh, to eat and long life. Just potentially. Just think with me for a moment. The, the verses here talk about the chambers or the fountains of the deep. Once again, let's look at Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah, this is a verse we read earlier, but we're going to go to a next verse. In the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day of the fountains, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So there's this canopy. It bursts and water pours onto the earth. And then the fountains of the deep, the waters that are under. And, it, and could you imagine what happens when that bursts forth? And so we've got these shifting of plates. And you look at the Grand Canyon. You look at the mountains. You look at all the different things that I believe personally as are results of the, this flood that we believe happened. That we can look at that and explain and say, this is what made the earth become the way it is today. 
water from under the earth. And, and to think of things, I mean, asking questions, and these are questions that ne- not, we can't necessarily answer in a church service, but how is it possible to get all that water to the poles to freeze up instantly? And the animals that they have found in frozen, in those places with food in their mouth that they were trying to chew and digest. After the flood, such a difference. Pre-flood, the sins were sins of rebellion. The sins were, it says, as in the days of Noah. After flood, uh, the eyes are opened to stars, maybe in ways. The stars they definitely saw before it, but ways before. And astrology took a new um, pull on the life of man. And, And you see at the Tower of Babel, these towers are being built. These ziggurats are being built. And ultimately, they try to reach up so that they can make a name for themselves and we worship we'll make a way so that we can get to heaven and God ultimately has to spread them out and change their languages you see as we look into the word of God that these these are things that we can look at and say maybe this was the case but I say all this to you because I want you to have an understanding that it's not bad for us to talk about them But we have to be very careful that we don't get too dogmatic. And this is exactly the reason that this happened. And this is that because there's good Christians on both sides of uh, this thing that say, we don't believe in evolution, but maybe it looked like this. I say all that for this reason. Science, once again, cannot be the Lord and determine and interpret the word of God based on science. There are certain things that we try to figure out. I remember growing up, now if you remember, there's a story about in, in uh, the book of Judges. I won't have you turn there. If you'd want to turn there, it's fine, but we're not going to have it up on the screen. Judges chapter 7. There's a story, and I remember, and it was well-meaning, and it made a lot of sense, and, and it would be the same thing that if I locked myself in and said, oh, this is why, this is, I, as I was preparing those things and sharing them with you, that could have been the case. But verses 6 through 8 just tells us that there's an expanse and there's waters on above and there's waters below. But this, this story in Judges kind of resonates with me when it comes to my interpretation of the Word of God and my understanding of the Word of God. And that's this. God has sent, or Gideon is a judge in Israel. And there are a group of people called the Midianites that are doing stuff against God's people. They're just harassing God's people. They're doing things that, that are ungodly. And, and there's, a, there's a cycle in the judges where um, God does something to save the people of Israel. And they're just so happy. And, but then after a while, they're, ah, they're only so into God. And then they start worshiping idols and they start living ungodly lives. And so God raises up a group of people that basically inflicts pain on them to make them realize, oh, man, I got to live with God. I got to walk right and stuff. And then God, out of love, out of that group of people called the Israelites, he raises up a judge to gather people to fight against those people. And ultimately that cycle continues through the book of Judges. Well, there's a story in, in Gideon where Gideon is raised up as a, as a judge and we're going to beat the Midianites. And so they got about, they got a lot of men to, to fight. And ultimately they get down to 10,000. And the Midian army is pretty decent size. And they're thinking, you know, we can beat them. And God's like, it's still too big. And so what he does is he says, um, we need to lower those numbers. And here's why. God always wants to get the glory. So that when it's all said and done, they could never go. Because maybe if there was like 20,000 against 10,000, somehow you won. There'd be a part of you going, yeah, we're, we're twice as tough as them. But if it's 300 against 20,000. That's got to be God. And so what he does is he says, he sends them and he says, have them go down by the water side. So they're down. Guys, stay with me. So you're getting that glazed over. I've got a water canopy, whatever. Um, and so they, 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 they send them, and you guys know, some of you know the story. They send them down by the water's edge and the ones that drank like a dog where they got down and they just basically sucked the water into their face, all right, was one group. And then the other group that cupped the water and drank 
That was another group. The drank like a dog group was the bigger number. We got 300. So you do the math. Out of 10,000, we got 300 that do this. Are you with me? When I was growing up and I had, I remember these, I don't want to name the teacher because if you ever watched YouTube, all right, but they would, and it was well-meaning, they would say, and here's why he picked them. He picked them because if they cupped the water and they drank it like that, they'd be able to see people coming in so they'd be better prepared for war. And you might have even done that. You meant well. It could be, but here's what I think it was. That was the less number so that God would get the glory. It was, because if it's that, oh, then they're, even, they're, they're smart enough to do this and they're the real good warriors. They're the ones who got it figured out. And this whole thing about salvation, it's not that I'm smarter. It, any victory in Jesus, it's not that I'm smarter. Here's the best thing. I depend on God completely. And so you may be here today and you go, okay, I think I got this thing down about a canopy. And I think I got this thing down about, um, you know, all, all these things concerning origins. And I'll do some study and you'll get some understanding. I want you to know, you will not go to heaven if you believe in a water canopy or the, in the fountains in the deep. In fact, I, I've looked in our hymnal. There are no songs about water canopies. But I got, I'm going to read you the words of a, of a hymn. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. We can't be too dogmatic of what that looked like. Boy, I'm telling you, I have so much fun thinking about this. Wow, you mean an earth where it's like, it's like this big greenhouse and dinosaurs walking around and, and, and man walking around. That's a pretty big dinosaur. I'm going to avoid it. You know, and all, and all this different stuff and, and how this, this whole thing played out. But more importantly, more importantly, I can be dogmatic about this. Without Jesus Christ, you are in a bad way. And you and I need a Savior. And I believe the Bible and I believe it wholeheartedly. And the, and the same God that created the universe also made it possible so that you could have eternal life. And so I want to encourage you, if you've never by faith received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, give your life to him. Put your, put your whole trust in him. Boy, that's, there's peace in that. There's forgiveness. There's joy.